much into the day. Um, now I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Yusuf Said, um, who is going to be the keynote speaker for us today. Yusuf is a reader in international education here at Sussex. He is also an education policy specialist with a career in international education and development. His work focuses on education policy, formulation and implementation, and he has published extensively on a number of themes ranging from education exclusion and exclusion, education governance and the role of the state, equity, financing education and quality education. So it's a great privilege for us to have you here, Yusuf, today. Thank you. I hope you don't mind, but I'm not intending to stand. I'll take the chair. So that's okay. And thanks, Marie, for the introduction. Okay, what I'm really going to talk about is the education consultations that took place over the last six months. And just as a way of briefly contextualizing, the consultations is now almost at the end of the process. And so, as I was walking across, the final synthesis of the education consultations is almost ready and going to go to press next week. At the same time, you probably all heard that the high-level panel has also released its report on its vision of the post-2015 education agenda. So in a sense, I think what is interesting and exciting about the policy work at this time is that a number of reports are coming out around what the future post-2015 development framework in general and then specific sectoral interests will look like. And this is all gearing up to the 13th of September, I think it's 13th of September, where the UN General Assembly will meet. I don't think they're going to make major uh, shattering decisions personally, but where they will meet to look at the last uh, uh, last couple of years of progress towards the MDGs and begin to articulate what the post-2015 agenda might look like. And in a sense, the one question you should be thinking about is why are you discussing this in 2013? You know? There's a bit of time. And why are people getting excited about a date which is almost a year and a half or two years away? And the reason is they want to avoid the lessons of the past. They want to enter 2015 with a reasonably clear framework so that a lot of the hard work and slog about what the post-2015 development framework looks like is done beforehand. Now, what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to try to get this across, right? What I want to talk about is both the process of how the, go of the discussions about the post-2015 agenda is going, I want to look at what seems to be at this stage an emerging consensus around the priorities. And it's quite surprising that given all the debate about it that there actually is some consensus. But then I want to talk about what the future goal for education will look like. And there's some emerging consensus about what that goal for the post-2015 education agenda was. There's a remarkable degree of, if you like, convergence both in the high-level panel report and in the education consultations about the goal. So let's start with the process. It took me some time and probably uh, uh, some time to figure out the complexities of who's involved, who's talking, when are they talking, etc. But effectively there are four main events or processes underway related to the post-2015 development framework. Remember the discussions are not about education. I'm focusing on education, but the discussion is about every aspect of development, whether that's water, whether that's energy, inequalities, governance. So uh, it's quite a wide-ranging discussion. But there are four, four main processes. And I'm only going to talk today mainly about one out of the four, which I've been mainly involved in. The first one is the UN or UNDP-led MDG review. And that has been the process of looking at the eight Millennium Development Goals in particular and figuring out what should replace the what should replace those eight goals or what form it should take. 
I'm not going to tell you what those eight goals are because I'm certain most of you by now know it. And if you don't, we can have a spot quiz at the end of the day. <laughs> if you can name the goals, the targets, and the indicators, that would be great, you know. Uh, but the UN, uh, UN-led MDG review is the one that is the most crucial one. And in its form, it's taking, it's covering 11 thematic areas, including education, but also including water health. And the website was in the, if you go back, the website, you'll find all the information is on the left-hand side of your screen, the world we want. If you go to the world we want, that's where you'll find all the information about the UN and UNDP-led MDG process, but also other information about the other processes. The second one is the high-level panel. And this is quite an interesting group because in a sense they're not, if you like, affiliated to any obvious constituency. They're effectively a group of eminent persons nominated partly by themselves and nominated partly by uh, the UN General Secretary. So they work under, if you like, uh, the UN General Secretary's ambit, but effectively they're a group on their own. But there are three co-chairs. The co-chairs are Indonesia, Liberia, and the UK. So those are the three co-chairs. They're a group of, and if you want to, I can give you all the names at some point, but they're about 12 people. They've just re released their report about a week ago called A New Global Partnership. Eradicate Poverty and Transform Economies Through Sustainable Development. So their report is different from the report I'll talk about. The third one is UNESCO itself is leading a process of considering stroke revising the EFA goals themselves. Now, education is, um, if you like, a slightly complicated process unlike other sectoral interests. Because as I'll show later, education is right, has two sets of rival goals. It has a set of EFA goals and it has a set of MDG goals related to education. And the fourth one, which is an important discussion underway, is, and it's a mouthful of acronyms, but it's the Open Working Group on sustain, Sustainable Development, basically. So there's a whole group looking at issues of sustainable development. I mean, the one point just to make immediately is that one of, when you read all the documents around the post-2015 agenda, it's fairly evident that if there's one thing that has gotten to the agenda is the word sustainable development. So people are talking about growth in relation to sustainability, they're talking about environmental degradation, environmental challenges. In a sense, it reflects a world that has changed since the MDGs were agreed in 2000. Specifically in terms of the education consultation linked to Bullet One, the UN, UNDP-led review process, there are two co-leads who are leading the education consult consultations. One is UNESCO and the second one is UNICEF. So they're the co-leads for the discussion of education. they supported and sponsored by uh, the government of Germany, the government of Senegal, the government of Canada, and the Unit Foundation. It's quite an interesting collection of groups. Now the process for consultation, I'll skip this one because it's all in the next slide. <clears throat> I've just cut and pasted the summary report in the box for you. And basically the claim that's made on the left, which is fairly true, is lots of numbers about how extensive the consultation process is. If you want really detailed numbers, I got detailed numbers from the main report. But for example, if those who play around with webs will be interested or not interested in the fact that there was almost half a million visits to the education website, uh, the education consultation, in not more than a four month period. So it's extensive uh, visits. But I think what I'm interested in reflecting on the process is three things. Karen King and Rob Palmer nicely put it. They said, is the discussions of post-2015 a northern tsunami and a southern ripple? Is it something exercising more accurately the north, while the global south tends to be quite silent, quite locked out of the conversation? 
it's a question, and I mean, I don't think it's totally true, but I think the question has to be asked. The extent to which the consultations in general and the education consultations in particular are reflecting the voices of, of the global south. The second question which struck me is that what has come out, and I spent many hours of looking at track changes and responses, that everybody has a specific sectoral and group interest about the post-2015 agenda. So if you speak to the health people, health is the be-all and end-all of development. The water people, water is the driving force of development. The education people is no development goal will be achieved without education. Or they speak from very specific organizational positions. So Save the Children will take a particular stance on it on the post-2015. Action Aid will take a particular stance, etc. And within the UN agencies, they all have their specific, if you like, pet topics, pet interests. Food and Agricultural Organization, they nine out of ten times will point out that you don't say enough of rural people, you know, for example, or you don't speak enough about food programs. If you speak to UNFPA, they would talk mainly about sexual and reproductive health education. UN women would definitely hone in without fail on the issue of gender and gender-based violence. So in a sense, the difficulty is balancing out agendas from sexual interests and group interest groups. And in a sense, which led me to reflect on whether the process was privileging the policy resource and the policy elites. You know, are we really seeing the voices of policy elites coming out more strongly and those are policy resources? I was looking at it this morning. I haven't yet come across a document of the Post-20 written by a Southern NGO. All right? I haven't seen Britam or ASA stating their position. But Save the Children managed to write three documents in about six months on the topic. And I'm beginning to wonder what the balances between the different policy processes. And so, yes, it's been unlike the when the goals were agreed in 2000, it's been a far more participatory, far more inclusive process. The question has to be asked the extent to which it's really been genuinely inclusive, or whether it's favored those who are policy resourced. I mean, I'm thinking here about dedicated groups like Brookings, for example. Brookings can marshal very quickly group of academics, group of NGOs, etc., together and produce a document very good document within a period of two to three weeks on the post-20. So there are questions to be raised about it. And then I guess the question that will continue to surface and continue to haunt the process is the extent to which these goals are going to matter in the global south. You know, Because ultimately, a lot of the focus when you look at actual content of the goal is directed in, implicitly or explicitly at the goal global south because that's where the challenges are greatest. Now, what I'm going to very quickly uh, uh, skip over but make a few points about it, an important aspect for UNESCO and U U UNICEF in terms of the education consultation was to look at the gaps in progress in education to look at the strengths of the current MDG framework and look at the weaknesses of the current framework. Now the complication, as I pointed out, is as follows. The education sector had a set of six goals prior to the adoption of the MDGs. So you, there were, those are the what are classically called the EFA goals. Yet, then later on in that same year, the MDGs emerged with a another set of goals, which in some senses captured some of the goals for the EFA, but considerably narrowed the goals, considerably narrowed the targets, and considerably narrowly the indicators. By contrast, the EFA was a bit like a feel-good document. You know, it had a very expensive vision, nice set of goals, but ultimately didn't deliver on clear concrete time-bound targets, and it very unlikely de delivered no indicators around one of its goals, which then comes up later, which is on quality. You know, it has this nice sounding goal on quality, 
but there were no targets and indicators. And when they operationalized it, when UNESCO and others operationalized it, they reduced quality to repetition in education, which as you know, or might know, is an efficiency measure, it's not a quality measure. Um, and clearly the main message, I guess, at the end, one of the main messages at the end of the day, in going forward that the biggest lesson of the past is to avoid two rival sets of goals. So countries still today, it amazes me, talks about our EFA plan and our MDG plan. And you think, what's the difference between the two? Or what should be the difference between the two? Now, in terms of the actual goal, this is well known if you read any aspect of the GMR, so I'm not going to talk about this, but the one thing that comes out in terms of progress, not surprisingly, is quality. It doesn't get focused on extensively. ECCE shows poor progress, and more worryingly, one of the gaps in education progress is, worryingly for many, the aid decline. There is an aid decline in educational spending over the last few years. So aid to education has actually literally, uh, you know, significantly de declined. Now, in terms of the strengths of the MDGs, I think it's, I can sum it up in one word. One is basically, when you have targets, people will work towards them. I mean, so I think the strap line is almost, I was reading the governance report, uh, Navi Pillay, who was presenting, who's the UN Human Rights uh, Commissioner, she was saying, what, we must, what gets measured effectively gets done. So we must measure what we treasure, or put it another way, we must measure what we value. Basically, the advantages of having a set of clear targets indicators is that with the specific stipulated time horizon is that people do work towards them. But I think more fundamentally, I think both the EFA goals and the MDGs signal a shift in 2000 with a more explicit poverty focus. Now maybe this wasn't, uh, this was fairly obvious to researchers, but it was less clear that governments and donors were spending more of their money or directing more of their money on poverty reduction policies and programs. So I think that was the effect of advantage or strength of the MDGs. I guess for me the other strength in reflecting on the process and reading the feedback and consultations was that a lot of people said that one of the strengths of the MDG framework was that it focused on developing monitoring systems and focused a lot more on accountability. But there's a caveat here and I'm going to read to you a very simple thing uh, from the high level panel which I think is important when you're thinking about goals. In its document it says, the suggested targets, goals, etc. are bold yet practical. Like the MDGs, they would not be binding, but should be monitored closely. And herein is the trick of global target setting. None of the global targets for education in the past and the future are going to have binding commitment. Right? They effectively functions as to use a word people of politicians of use like a moral compass. So they work on the art of moral persuasion. So that if we can morally persuade people to ascribe and take up these goals, then hopefully they will work towards them. And if we can put monitoring mechanisms in place, then people will also work to, towards them. But unlike other international covenants and legislations, they don't have any status in international law. So effectively, if a country chooses not to accept any of the current or future goals, there's nothing anybody can do about it. Right? You might be able to put the pressure if you had aid as the, your leverage mechanism, but you don't. So if you take, for example, but our single countries, but if you take a one of the fast new emerging economies, if it chooses not to accept any of the goals that are set, there's nothing the global community can do. Because the, the, the way the whole language of targets and goals set, it acts as more, uh, moral commitments rather than legally binding commitments. And the high level panel, I think, puts it crisply, clearly, and, uh, and very transparently so.
Now, what were the weaknesses of the current MDG framework? I think in a sense there are just two or three I want to highlight upon because I think the more interesting issue is what the goal is. You know? This is all like a prelude to telling you, me telling you what the goal is going to look like. The biggest one, I guess for me, is the fact that while poverty as an, as, uh, while poverty as an anchoring framework of the 2000 goal setting uh, agenda was correct, it was misplaced in that it failed to look at inequality. In a sense, to put it another way, to use Tony's work, poverty is simply the unacceptable face of inequality. So the bigger problem is inequality. The problem is not really poverty per se. Inequality is fundamentally the biggest problem of it. Because poverty is always relational in every sorts of ways, between rich and poor. And so one of the most most important and strongest messages coming out from the education consultations but across all con uh, consultations is that you need a stronger focus on inequality for the new development framework post-2015. Inequality has to sit at the heart of the new development framework. And in fact, in terms of theorizing and research, I think there's a lot more work that needs to be done to situate inequality theoretically within a development framework in education broaders. And because it failed to put inequality at the heart of the agenda, in a sense it failed to identify the root causes of poverty and ignored power relations. What the MDGs inadvertently done, it targeted the near poor. Right? Because that's why we have these large numbers of hard to reach, because it had a very under-theorized notion of the structural causes of poverty. And I often get criticized for this when I say it, is the goals and targets were lacking in ambition, but they were narrow and reductionist in approach. So the, the come back and repost to me from the other side of the fence is that, well, by definition, goals are reductions, which is partly true. But I think it's, some, it's nonetheless true. <coughs> The other aspect of the MTGs, which in a sense you can see is addressed partially in the high level panel, but it's also much stronger as part of the discussions on the education consultation, is goal setting is an aspirational act. You focus on where you want to be, the destination, the target, the goal. You don't focus on a discussion of the means to get there. So you privilege the, de the destination and you de-emphasize the, uh, the, the route you're going to take or the means you're going to achieve that. And in a sense, part of the discussion in the current education consultation is we need to pay a lot more attention to focusing on if you're going to generate a lot more ambitious goals for the post-2015 agenda, and as I'll say later, it is going to be a lot more ambitious, how are you going to get there? How are you going to get the financing? Because if aid is declining for basic education and primary education, and if you want to expand to secondary education or lower secondary and that, how are you going to finance that? And where are you going to get that? So it's about the understanding the mechanisms and the means to achieve the goals. Um, I also think that the one other weakness of the current MDG framework is that all the targets and goals were set globally. There was very little attention to, to, to looking at regional goal setting or national goal setting. And I think the challenge going forward is how are you going to balance and achieve this fine balance between global target setting and more nationally owned and regionally specific or contextually specific goals. I mean, that's why you have somewhat of, somewhat in the current framework, meaningless targets, like 50% reduction of illiteracy. It doesn't make sense. Or you have achieved universal primary education for all. And you look at a situation like uh, South Africa, which had 98% a net enrollment ratio to start with, which by definition makes it universal. It doesn't mean real terms, but by definition. So it, it, you, you get into the silly situation of global targets which don't match country realities. 
So for South Africa, as far as it's concerned, its MDG report looks fantastic on education because even before 2000, it was doing very well in terms of net enrollment ratio for primary education. So it didn't have a problem to start off with. Yet the global target suggested there was a problem, and it was. So there's a lot, going to be a lot of discussion on it. Now, before I look at the goals, I mean, the one strong message emerging from the education consultation is that in a sense, the problem with the education conversation, in a sense, is that you talk to yourself often. Uh, and you need it to, like every other thematic consultation, make a stronger claim for education and other development outcomes. So, in a sense, the case for education may be self-evident to us, but try to telling that across 11 thematic consultation for whom the case for education is not as self-evident. So, part of the consultations brought out very strongly uh, how education is as associated with many development outcomes and uh, here's some ways of which the final synthesis report will argue the status of education both as a right and an end in itself but also if you like its instrumental its extrinsic benefits now, what is interesting and perhaps the strongest argument to be made uh, for education is the fact that when people vote, and I'm not saying the voting was perfect, but when they voted in the My World survey, education, uh, good quality education was the topmost priority followed by health. So people weren't voting for good governance. They were voting for education, things they knew. And I think here's the significant part that it was mainly people under the age of 30 who were voting. And I'll tell you why, because the one global shift that has occurred over 2000 is that you're going to witness in the next few years the largest youth bulge globally. Right? South Africa, for example, has reached that point of what they call the sweet demographic transition, where it's reached a huge, huge uh, large youth bulge but also youth working population and that can pay significant dividends economically for inclusive growth but it can equally go the other way as well and in a sense a lot of the conversations about the consultations in one way or another and I can give you there are lots of quotes in the consultation people were worried about youth unemployment whether that's true or not you know but certainly youth unemployment youth unrest, you know, youth behavior, but there's a strong feeling, and the, this is reflecting, their comments around youth were reflecting the significant demographic shift, particularly in low and medium income countries around a growing number of young people uh, who are coming through the system. And it's not unrelated, I'm put it this way, it's not unrelated to success on the other MDGs like the reduction in infant mortality, etc. So the, the goals tend to work together. So, and it's not unrelated to the fact that you have expanded a lot more primary education in a lot more countries. If you also look at another, or the, by the way, if you play around with the website, and there's hundreds of websites around post-2015, but the one that's useful is called the North-South Inst Institute and the ODI. I've used them in particular. They have been, done a fantastic job of tracking the proposals around the post-2015. Now, interestingly, whether you look at it by the, whether I use the ODI tracking tool, or whether I use the North-South Institute tracking tool, when we did, if you like, the crude number crunching, <coughs> education comes out again top. So, whichever direction you're looking at it, education's clear. That's why I'm, I'm not as concerned as some people have understandably been that education is dropping of the post-2015 agenda. I'm less concerned. I started off being concerned when I first started this work. I was really concerned that education was dropping off the agenda. And as the work developed, I become less concerned. I'm not saying there's no issue, but I'm saying I become less concerned. Now, this is just a statement that's drawn from the other in other consultations, uh, you're going to keep me on track on time. Yeah, can I go on? Here's just statements about different, uh, different or uh, different um, 
consultation showing the links. Uh, right? Basically, it's interesting the growth in employment consultation for argues that education underpins all social progress. Right? If the general education level worldwide is improved, global unemployment problems can be hugely tackled. Well, it's an assertion, they can one debate about its merits, its argument, but clearly that group is making a strong claim for the link between education. And when we reviewed very briefly all the 11 consultations on health, gender, conflict, good governance, climate change, everyone in one way or another mentioned education. So the results of the My World survey are not unsurprising because a lot of the other development priorities that are going to feature in a post-2015 agenda emerges from education, or linked to education, or relies on some form of education or the other. So I'll skip that. What I want to put down now is coming to the heart. So having looked at, and the consultations having looked at what the strengths, weaknesses are, and having looked at the role and of education development, what were the, some of the main principles and priorities which, if you like, uh, emerge from the WASH? And I have to say there's a remarkable degree of convergence. Maybe the language is different, and language is always different because every particular group wants its own language about how it's going to articulate the goal. But there was a remarkable degree of con convergence at the headline level of what's important, but more fundamentally what the principles are. And I guess the straight up most important principle for the post-2015 agenda is a human rights approach, or rights-based approach. And that's an, 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 but the human rights approach, which has at its core both a commitment to equality and equity. And I think the distinction is important. I won't take a lot of time explaining it, but simply that equity does mean privileging the marginalized and vulnerable. So in a sense, it operates on the principle of justice as opposed to the principle of sameness, which the principle of, which the notion of equality works on. The other point on the slide which is important is for the first time, I think, people are saying that the global agenda must focus both on rich and poor countries. It must equally apply to the global south as to the global north. In 2000, the entire agenda was focused on the global south. There's one goal tucked at the end about how you work together in trade and, you know, etc., and free trade. But effectively, if you took away everything else, it was a, it was a global compact for the south and not for the north. The north were relegated to partners in either getting money. But the framing of principle of inequality means that you need to tackle inequality in the north in as much as in you have to tackle it in the south. Because inequality is not limited to geography or nation states. I'll skip this, but let me just say the three hi highlights and then I'll go to the goals. One fairly obvious one is that the one consensus is the next global agenda is going to move away from a focus on primary education. In a sense, that's obvious. And this is not surprisingly, because for many countries, the primary education agenda is almost over. You know, not all countries, but in a sense, it's over. Let me skip to the, th let me just talk about the three priorities, because then I'll talk about it in relation to the goal. The second one, and there's no uh, disagreement at one level about this, is a focus on education quality. What exactly about education quality? That's where the disagreement starts. But at the headline level, everybody wants quality and learning to be. But what learning is and what quality is, that's where the differences come. Now, there are a few things that there is consensus about. One is that we still need to focus on the learning environment. We need to focus on learning at the heart of the agenda. Whether that's going to be fun foundational literacy and numeracy or other things is going to be the big debate. Teachers, and I think this is the first time there's an explicit recognition of the role of teachers in relation to quality. Then there was a strong discussion 
And it's hard to classify it because whichever classification I use, somebody had a problem with, right? Mm. So for now, I'm just going to call it, there was a lot of discussion around somehow education must be irrelevant. And they talked about relevance in a number of ways. Relevance of education must be about the opportunities and skills for decent work. It's got something we know to do with sustainable development. It must have something to do with citizenship, whether that's global or national. It's got something to do with sexual and reproductive uh, health education. For some, anchored within a rights-based approach. For others, more, if you like, life skills, sex education, or sexuality education. It's uh, debatable. <clears throat> Clearly, there are some cross-cutting issues across those priorities, gender being one, inclusion, and not surprisingly, education in emergencies around issues of those who find themselves in conflict or post-conflict situations, but also those who are, find themselves under conditions of natural disasters. There's a stronger emphasis on education pre preparing and responding to the situation of natural disasters, which are growing more. There are a greater number of natural disasters, and they seem to be more intense in effect than in the past. So this has all led to finally a discussion in five minutes about the goal. What's the goal? All right. Before that, I just want to say, and, and I'll skip this slide. I'll skip the slide, but in arriving at the goal, part of what we did was, and I know Keith will talk extensively about it, but the Commonwealth Ministers is one sectoral interest group amongst many that have put forward goals. Right? And what is interesting about the, those who talked about goals in education, the GMR, Commonwealth and the Caribbean Ministers only focused on education goals, ignoring the development agenda. So for them, it was education only. So in a sense, they were operating with what we call an EFA plus framework. Whereas for others, education was a single goal amongst other development goals, like save the children. For others, it was more thematic. There wasn't an, there shouldn't be an education goal, although they end up with an education goal, which is interesting. But we should rather have thematic priorities like inclusive growth, inclusive human development, in which the sectoral interests are embedded within them. I know I'm skipping this, but you can ask this in the question of time. I want to go to the goal. So here's finally what the goal is. The overarching goal is equitable quality education and lifelong learning for all. A bit of a mouthful. And as somebody said, it's probably one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight words too many. Right? <laughs> but it's a bit of a mouthful, right? But what it's trying to do in the goal, it's trying to upfront equity, it's upfronting quality, and it's using lifelong learning to suggest expanded access. Right? Now, if you're doing a semantic deconstruction of this word, it's a tautology, right? as everybody will point out, that you can't have for all and equitable, because by definition, for all implies equity. Right? Having said that, this, uh, if you do a further discourse analysis, what people are doing is they're placing a mark on equity in the title. So it's not, the for all can easily not focus on equity because you had education for all and somehow equity got lost. Right? So in a sense, this is goal. So this goal is trying to capture the twin imperatives of equitable access and equitable quality. So if you like, we're still dealing with the two imperatives of access and quality framed within an equity and inequality perspective. It's also trying to develop a goal which will hopefully be valid for all countries while emphasizing the need for international support to the poorest countries. So in a sense, this is a goal that could be equally applicable to the UK as it's to Rwanda or Nigeria or any other country. That's the intention at least. The goal is also in the discussions today trying to balance internationally comparable goals because you, somehow if you don't have international goals and targets, right, how are you going to monitor progress across national ways? So you want to achieve a fine balance between the two. Uh, now, 
just unpacking the girls. Equitable and inclusive access is interpreted at all levels, ECC, post-basic and higher education. It's also focused on the quality of learning environments and actual learning outcomes, including the content and relevance of education. So it's bringing together those priorities. I'm going to skip this and go on to the HLP proposal. The reason I'm mentioning the HLP goal is virtually identical to the education consultation goals. It says provide quality education and lifelong learning. So drop the word equity and drop the word for, uh, for all. So it's reduced it to five. So that's a bit better, I guess. But similar to uh, education, there are four main priorities that everybody seems to be agreeing in terms of targets and goals. Firstly, there's an agreement in, in education consultation and HLP that there should be an increase in enrollments in pre-primary education. The education consultation goes further and says of a minimum of at least one year, but preferably two years. So the future agenda is that if you drill down that goal, one of the possible sub-goals or targets or whatever you want to call it is that it's going to be an expansion of pre-primary education to one or two years for everybody. What it drops out, by the way, is anything that deals with the situation of children before pre-primary. So the earlier some suddenly drops out. The reason it drops out is because it's hard, to, there are no goals and hard to formulate and agree on goals for the early years. It still focuses on primary education, which is not surprising, but this is the big one. It now has included lower secondary education. Although the formulation of the education consultation, if I had time I'd show you, is different from the HLB, both are talking about the target will be about measurable learning outcomes in foundational literacy and numeracy. Now the interesting thing is that at the end of the day, the consultations have dropped anything to do with anything other than literacy and numeracy. So if you like, it's a back to basics target. Right? So anything like, so while the priorities talk about citizenship, everything else, when, they, when the narrowness of the goal is being constructed, foundation and literacy is privileged, for better or worse. And clearly the next goal, given the youth pulse, both the HLP and the education consultation talk very strongly about the provision of skills. There's a strong language of skills in both those documents. Okay, in the last minute that I'm going to steal, in addition to that, right, and though I got this tough side, right, uh, can I just say, okay. I guess going forward, what's going to be hard, I want to read again the HLP document because I think uh, the HLP document is really interesting in this regard. All right. Uh, the HLP document, what it's saying about education and about targets, it's saying that we realize that any vision would be incomplete under, unless we offered a set of illustrative goals and targets to show how these transformative changes could be expressed in precise and measurable terms. What they're saying is that the hard test is really translating any broad development framework and commitment to goals. And to put it another way, ultimately, the really tough call comes in when hard priorities must be selected and not just listed. When mechanisms for implementation needs to be agreed, and when concrete action plans are going to come up against a difficult political economy of change globally. So, in a sense, the ultimate task going forward is going to be how you take this broad goal and those emerging very specific goals and secure agreement. How are you going to limit the new set of goals to only literacy and numeracy? Well, in a sense, you could argue it's actually a step forward. But if you're going to do that, will you be driving out all the other valued learnings and education? So going forward, 
clearly one of the things is going to be translation of the goal into priorities. But there are three things or four things that are, have come out very strongly which are important. Financing is going to be the biggest challenge for the way forward. And I think there's going to be a strong discussion. Participation and accountability, people are for the first time talking about a people-centered agenda of development. I'm not myself quite sure what different people mean, but at least it's a step forward. The last thing that will have to be resolved one way or the other is how the EFA and the MDGs. The consultation is very clear about that. It's very clear about the need to have one common post-2015 agenda. The consultation said it in clear that there should be no two rival global education agendas and that if one thing we learn from the past is not to have it. Now I guess I'll end up there. It's been a bit of a long uh, tour, but hopefully most of the stuff is on the post 2015 agenda. Thanks. very deep insight into what's going on now. Um, shall we have what is called a Sussex buzz? Um, shall we have a little talk with our neighbours and just raise a few aspects that we particularly enjoyed? Um, so we